Welcome to the SAG-AFTRA Foundation's The Business Program. I'm Audrey Cleo Yap, culture and trends expert for Pandora. Before we're joined by our guests today, I want to let you know that the SAG-AFTRA Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG-AFTRA artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given nearly $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a sag after artist in need of help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description box of this video. Okay, let's get started. I am so excited to introduce this panel. We have Antoinette Messam from The Harder They Fall, Bob Morgan and Jacqueline West from Dune, Paul Taswell from West Side Story, Janty Yates from House of Gucci, Clint Ramos from Respect, and Kirsty Cameron from The Power of the Dog. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. What a Robbie. great, fantastic crop of films. And I think one of the things that all of your films have in common is really, really rich source material, whether it's previous films, books, historical figures, newsreels, like, you know, you name it. Um, Bob and Jacqueline, I want to start with you and what you had to do for Dune, because you got books, you've got some, a movie that was previously made. You know, how did you incorporate that? Did you lean on that source material at all? Well, I mainly uh, used the book as my source and kind of came to sci-fi as a, as a virgin. <laughs> I'd never seen Star Wars. I'd never seen David Lynch's virgin, version of Dune. And I just felt like I was just coming, you know, with a clean slate. And I just really started from uh, my feelings about the book and Denis, who had deep, deep feelings. The director, Denis Villeneuve, had deep feelings about the book since he was 14, I think. And so we started just talking about it, mainly his, you know, his vision. And I relied on, I relied on that, what the sets were uh, looking like. And uh, though Frank Herbert doesn't describe costumes other than the still suit, he gives really a rich uh, feeling, uh, a mood. So I drew on that primarily. That's fantastic. And, and when you have that much source material to work from, you know, is it, is it a blessing or is it a curse? Paul, I actually want to ask you because in your case, you have this iconic film, iconic looks, you know, I, how, do you, how do you deal with that tension of how much do I go back to the source? How much do I, you know, create something new? Sure. I mean, my, my process is to collect as much imagery as I can, um, you know, to fill the pot as, as, as deeply, as, as, as uh, broadly as I can, and then go in and edit. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's like with choices, I'm sure that, you know, all the designers here, you know, the, having choices is, is imperative for me uh, anytime that I am making a decision because I want to know everything that might be available. So, uh, you know, as I'm investigating character, it's the same thing. I and mean, having, you know, as many uh, examples of what a person might wear at that time in that year uh, just gives me more confidence in making the decision about a character. And for, I want to hear from Kirstie Clint and, and Janty and, and Bob, I don't think we actually heard from you about you. <laughs> I, I, I would say from, you know, the source material, obviously the book is, is so descriptive, like Jacqueline said, mm -hmm. although he gives hints to what things are, it doesn't say exactly, but Denis had a clear vision. And, and the beauty of that was he made a framework for us because we knew what it was and we knew what it wasn't, which left a real wide chasm of creativity to work with him. Yeah. Uh the, uh, when I um, first like approached the project, um, of course, I read the book, which is quite astounding. Um, the the book that was that Thomas Savage wrote in 1967, and um, it, there was so much information in there in terms of um, the clothing that they wore, and um, there was a lot of detail and a lot of sort of subtext. And I think that Jane, um, you know. Uh, 
transferred that into the script as well. And I very much kind of jammed off that and, um, yeah, tried to channel that into um, that sort of undercurrent that the clothing plays a part of. Um, so, yeah, it was very, very, <clears throat> um, very much present in the material. And for Clint, Antoinette and Janty, I mean, you're dealing with people who who actually lived. Um, Antoinette, I mean, this is a fictional, Heart of They Fall is a fictionalized story, but these were real people. These were real historical figures. Yeah, tell me about sourcing and your relationship to, you know, that source material. Well, the interesting thing is I didn't know these people existed. I mean, I read the script and thought they were fictional and then, of course, started to do the research and their faces started to pop up in front of me. And I'm like, whoa, Nat Love existed. So, I mean, they they didn't they were they were from different parts of the Victorian era. So they weren't it wasn't like I had them all at the same time. So it was one thing to research who these people were and see their style and their essence and take that in. But then I had to park it because it was a different story and not only a different story, different periods of, it. you know, I think one person was at Bass Reeves was more Edwardian than he was Victorian. So there were elements that I was able to glean that that was, that was, would be a nice touch, but it was more of research of understanding the base. And what about these people that my director pulled from their stories to add to our stories? But in terms of creative, I didn't look at their, their physical story and, and visual presence and take draw any inspiration from that because it was there wasn't any similarities other than the name and paying homage to these people, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I do want to talk about where you all drew your inspiration for looks um, a little bit later, but Clint and Janty, um, I want to know about you know your relationship, Clint. You're 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 transforming Jennifer Hudson into Aretha Franklin. <laughs> yeah, I think it's you know I I, I think like with what uh, I agree with all of what the designers had said, but I think part of um, I, I like what Antoinette said about parking it, you know, because there's so much extant photographs. This was a life well lived, and you, she and she dressed up, and but there were um, there were also a lot of moments that you know that that she wasn't photographed, right? And prior to her hitting the Columbia years, there were very 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 little extant photographs of her. And then you kind of just like really look at those, you know, what you've collected, the repository of stuff that you have, and you just kind of like say, hey, which is appropriate and which do you know which is useful, I suppose, you know, because you ultimately want to go back to the story, right? Sometimes um, what is historically um, presented actually doesn't serve the story somehow, you know, um, and you you just kind of, you, you find ways to recalibrate and kind of um, drive the car into this sort of circuitous road, you know, um, but, but yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's about collecting as much as you can and, you know, and using what you can, I suppose. You know. I would imagine that none of you are like minimalists, at least your closets, right? <laughs> With the amount of collections and fashion and, and, and amazing stuff that you have. Janty, you basically got to live my dream. You got Alessandro mm-hmm. Michele, creative director of Gucci. You got his blessing to go into the archive I mean, tell me about diving into this and really actually like what informed ended up going into the the film ultimately, House of Gucci. Well, the irony is that um, like all your former speakers, you just have to really gather as much. And it's quite easy because Ridley was there. I was there during these years. We knew what people wore. We knew everything about it. And um, LG herself never wore Gucci. So we did actually put her in some Gucci archive. Um, but like Lady Gaga, she, right? D- Lady Gaga. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I don't think I'm allowed to call her LG, but you absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't really call her Lady Gaga. You know, it doesn't really run off the tongue easily. Or does <laughs> Stefania. Um, but, you know, she wore a lot of Saint Laurent, she wore a lot of Givenchy, she wore a lot of um, Dior. And so uh, my my main aim was to make, and my cutter, who was superb, just created this body of costume for her. 
And then we, I was able to find vintage, a vintage archive that was as big as my whole ground floor um, in Tirelli, the uh, costume house in Rome. But, you know, there were a lot of other people to costume at the same time. And uh, so basically we had mainly made on a Savile Row basis for most of the men, for certainly for Adam, um, Maurizio and Al Pacino, my Savile Row tailor, who I'm sure you know, you guys know, uh, Lynn Logsdale. He's just a genius. And uh, so he made about 40 looks for Adam and he made... 15, 20 for Al. And then down in uh, Naples, I had the tailor from the tailors from The Great Beauty, um, who, which is one of the most beautifully tailored films I've ever seen. They made Jared's suits and they called him, I think he was a dandy's dandy because he's so out there. But, you know, then we had to collect a huge amount of um, vintage, huge amounts to, um, obviously, as everyone had to, you know, to um, to costume the extras, to costume the day players. You just always have to just go about it and collect as much as you can. And then you'll feel safe. <laughs> Got it all in your back pocket. <laughs> If you don't mind just dropping Lynn's, uh, your tailor at Salva Rose information in the chat box later, Janty, just so yes. we can, you know, all share in that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, you, you were all talking about a lot of the inspiration. I'm, I'm curious about like, were there any unexpected sources of inspiration? Like Jacqueline, I know I had read that you looked at tarot cards, like old tarot cards or, or you know, for the projects that you all worked on, was there any kind of an unexpected source for you? Kirsty, let's, let's uh, actually Jacqueline, let's start with you since I mentioned. Um, I did use tarot cards for Mother Mohayam, definitely the Marseille tarot and the Golden Tarot and uh, the Queen of Wands uh, uh, and the High Empress. I did draw on that. I used a lot of, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of medieval references. I once read uh, my favorite art historian, John Berger, said uh, there were only two uh, painters from those times that would be film directors, Giotto and um, who else did he say, and Goya. And so I took his hint and used a lot of painting references from the period. Uh, we, we drew on a lot of medieval references uh, for the armor, the Knights Templar, and as it was a world starting over, we decided um, to make it cyclical that, uh, you know, to see the future, you look at the past. And um, so 10,000 years ahead, a world starting over, it seemed kind of an interesting place to draw from. So a lot of, there were a lot of medieval references in our work. I just love that idea of drawing from a source like that. I just would never have thought, but I guess there's inspiration uh, if you look for it anywhere, right? Um, Not evil. Uh, <laughs> and and, and contempor you know, as far as like Geiger for for uh, the Harkonnens and bugs and exoskeletons for the Harkonnens, you know, going to a very naturalistic um, uh, entity to create that kind of exoskeleton look they had. Love that. Um, I want to add to this, surprisingly, and it was my father who pointed this out to me, I'm, I'm Jamaican, and one of the things that really I loved and is memorable for me about this film is all the music. My director played reggae music constantly on set. I mean, he would cue the, the action to beats to reggae songs, mm -hmm. and my father watched a rough cut with me because he... I mean, he fanned out on the fact that I was doing a Western. He says, Nat looks like Bunny Whaler. And I just, it just blew my mind. And I realized he's right. I was pulling from um, early reggae artists and their swagger and their hats and the way they wore their jackets. And I didn't even, it didn't even connect to me because it was so instinctive. I mean, I, I, we had, you know, lots of period references, but when I think about it now, I had the music playing and all the, you know, all the imagery of these reggae artists, one after the other, Jimmy Cliff and all that. And I, it took my father to point out to me that 
some of my actors look like the reggae artists he came up with in the 60s and the 70s. So that was interesting that someone else, my, my, my parent pointed that out to me. <laughs> I love that. And, and I also want to acknowledge that we have two um, designers who worked on Westerns, Kirstie and you, Antoinette, two very different Westerns. And I actually have a, a question for the two of you uh, because both films have such amazing hats, accessories. <laughs> um, specifically, Kirstie, I want to talk about Phil's chaps the chaps that we see um, mm-hmm. and, and how you sourced those. And then Antoinette, we got to talk about the ladies hats, specifically the ones that you found for Zessie Beats and Regina King. But Kirsty, let's start with, let, I want to hear, I want to hear the story behind the chaps. <laughs> well, uh, just to answer your previous question as well, yes, yeah, um, sure. with regards to um, kind of um, inspiration and um, the, the producers on the film, um, uh, the, although I think the BBC paid for it, um, put together a fantastic reference library that we access had access to um, with amazing like historical images and um, of um, cowboys and, <clears throat> and just people from, you know, 1800s right through to, to um, contemporary images. And that was a really fantastic resource um, that I, I pulled on. But then also, you know, like Richard Abbott, um, so Abaddon's photos of uh, his portraits that he took were really in, inspiring for Phil's um, character for me. And, you know, so it was kind of like a real mix of contemporary and um, historical. Um, and the chaps, we we made the chaps um, out of New Zealand sheepskin. Um, we have a lot of sheep here. Well, not as many as we used to, but um, yeah. So we, we had a fantastic leather worker, um, Helen Fuller on, on the film and, um, we did a lot of the belts and a lot of the um, all the um, spur leathers and the, and a couple of the pairs of the chaps, yeah, and including those sheepskin ones, because um, of course they needed to be. Um, we wanted them to be dark and um, they needed to be specific for him. Um, we of course made them well before Benedict got to the country and took them down and it's like, yes, they, they worked, you know, and he just inhabited them so, so beautifully. Um, but yeah, they were, they came from scratch, those chaps. <laughs> and they were in the film, they were in the script, you know, this idea of this kind of satyr like um, proportional um, fill that, you know, they kind of created, particularly there's a shot where you see them from behind sort of silhouetted in the barn the door of the barn and um yeah so they and they they sort of you know benedict really um owned them as you can tell <laughs> yes 100 percent. and Antoinette, i mean zessie as stagecoach mary her hat was just I, I think it's also because seeing the two the two female leads have these very prominent pieces was so striking um tell me about uh, creating that I inherited the hat, <laughs> that hat. I actually tried to switch it. Can we switch them? <laughs> but it was it was scripted. It was um, something that um, James incorporated in his short film, the one he did prior to this, um, which was the base for this film. Um, it was important for him that this character have a striking, strong hat, and it had to be a top hat. The majority of my principals, their hats were all custom which was an incredible experience for me, um, having the opportunity to create from scratch, working on the silhouette and deciding what these actors um, was gonna be their signature piece. I mean, there's a joke that you could be in the dark and but we'd know from the silhouettes of the hats, who was who. <laughs> and so it was really distinctive, especially for the two gangs to create these hats. So Mary and Trudy's hats were very much a storyline and, 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 and very much a part of James's journey that these women be in strong, very signature hats that said, you know, we we are we are we're a strong woman and we own it and so um and she carried it well didn't she i'm still oh. shocked that the hat didn't fall off on, on a regular basis but yes the the hat was custom and i've got to give kudos to 
all the hat vendors that I found and pulled out of hats, especially in the middle of a pandemic in, in, in New Mexico, in Los Angeles, that came forward. It, it, was, it was something because we had to make them. I, most of those hats, we had like a dozen of them for different people. Wow. I want to get into kind of the nitty gritty of working with actors and the fitting process and kind of, you know, helping them build uh, their character's sartorial identity, really. Um, Clint, like, where does that start with you? Like, how was that with, especially specifically working with Jennifer to embody Aretha? I think it starts with a lot of conversations. You know, I think we've we've had had numerous times, numerous hours of fittings. Um, but we were kind of, I was really, really fortunate that Jennifer started work very early on it. And so we just kind of like jumped on the bandwagon. She had been doing dialect work, um, movement work and all that prior to even the formal prep period. And so I just kind of tacked on there and, you know, started like those conversations early on. Um, you know, I, as I collected a lot, like, uh, like Janty said, you just collect so much. And I collected a lot of vintage um, clothing um, just to sort of like look at, what you know what it would do to her body and how she would react to it and you know how and and so those conversations started there and um the i would say the first maybe two fittings we had like two the the first two fittings were like six hours long and um and it was really just about learning you know first of all each other sort of like you know getting this idea of trust and then talking about aretha and um and that was sort of like um the foundation the foundation is always the conversation i think things really it's funny that you say that you know um um uh, how we formed the character sartorial identity because i always got kind of like it, 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 to me, these fittings are, is not only about sartorial identities, but actually about identities um, uh, in general, right? Like, because I think part of what happens in fittings is, is, is an establishing of how the character not only looks, but actually moves, you know, um, and the characters and how they exhibit both their insecurities and what they're proud of, you know, what they're trying to cover and what they're trying to sort of um, uh, show. So those fittings are actually really crucial. They're almost like, as I would say, I would argue as crucial as like voice work or like movement work, because it's really about, creating what that character has decided what her presentation was for that very day, you know, for a particular day, right? Um, uh, there, are, there are many scenes where, there's a couple of scenes where she goes through sort of like her husband um, uh, commits violence on her, right? And I always trip when, you know, fight directors or like stunt directors always say, oh, can you put like this? Can, can, can she be wearing something like this? Or can she be wearing something like that? And, and, and I always, it always fascinates me because I think the conversation always goes to like, well, I don't think she knew she was going to get beat up that day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so yes no she's going to be wearing that gown she just came from a concert and her husband decides she, he's going to punch her that's what she's wearing you know and and it's always I, I i i think the beauty of costuming is that we can present these kind of like situations that are almost idiosyncratic right like like horrible horrible behaviors happening in a beautiful shell, you know, like, or, or like beautiful, beautiful behaviors happening in a, in an ugly shell, for instance. And, and, and all of that happens in a fitting, you know, all of that, all of those conversations. I, um, anyway, I go on and on and on, but like, I love fitting. I love fitting because they're, like con- <laughs> they're a lot of work. And that's also one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of people take for granted. That's, uh, th- that's literally the workroom for a costume designer. It's yeah. so much work. Exactly. And I then lots fight, of, no, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Jump no, in. I was just going to say the, the, the fight um, guys ask for six of them. And it's a vintage piece that you found online, you know, and it just happened to work perfectly. And it's like running around, trying to find a matching fabric, trying to make six of them, like never, ever works. But I hear you, Clint, so, so clearly. I love fittings. I love them. They, they're the, they're the your source. They really are. And the actors usually, I find, um, get the hook, get the hook 
of their character so strongly with a costume fitting, you know, not probably as much in hair and makeup as well, but it just, because we're in the beginning, they just identify and they can just work their way through your choice of costume and just go, oh, I think that would be wonderful for that scene. And it just works like that a lot of the time. <laughs> I want to continue this theme of fitting since it, it is such a big part of your work. And, and with Paul, you, for West Side Story, you know, as I'm watching this, I'm thinking also this is this stunning choreography, but also how are they going to move in this stuff? And, and I, I want, yeah, tell, tell me about factoring that in as you're, as you're working with your actors. When you're dealing with the genre of, uh, of musical, you know, musicals, uh, film musicals, I mean, you, you have to acknowledge uh, the function of the clothes. I mean, you, you know, I, I uh, am always aware that uh, this piece of clothing is going to need to move in this scene in a certain way. Um, and so, you know, that, that was a large part of, you know, whilst, you know, creating designs that were plausible for the period and for the character, uh, making sure that uh, it would move in the way that um, Justin Peck, the choreographer, and, and that Steven Spielberg, you know, in, in the end, wa wanted for them to move and how he wanted to show off the clothes and how the clothes became an extension of that movement of the choreography. Um, you know, we, we were custom making uh, all of the jeans for the Jets because they needed to be able to be athletic uh, in them. And, you that, know, it's so funny. That that's exactly what I was thinking <laughs> from the opening scenes. And I'm watching these these amazing dancers move, but it looks I, were they jeggings? Were they? Please, please tell us all your secrets. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they were they were built by um, an, you know, an amazing. Uh, you know, kind of a, 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 a re recreation or a, a throwback uh, gene maker. Um, and then Levi's agreed to do some as well, but uh, they needed to be uh, made according to the 1950s or mid 1950s style. Yeah. Um, and that was not something that we were going to be able to find uh, on the rack. I mean, you know, we, we and, you know, we definitely weren't going to be able to, to use uh, actual period uh, vintage vintage jeans. So, um, you know, we went about uh, building all of them with, uh, you know, stretch denim uh, and then broke down, you know, that we did break down on all of the jeans so that they looked as authentic as possible. Um, you know, the, the same with uh, the, the dresses and how they would move for, you know, first of the dance at the gym and then also for America, uh, that we, you know, it, they were built in a very specific way so that, uh, all the petticoats, you know, held together, and so that you saw, you know, the legs and the, you know the body within all of that, uh, and that they would respond to their to their moves as, uh, uh, you know, kind of it, it immediate as as you would want for the choreography and for the shots that Stephen was after. Um, so you know, it, it as well as you know, or alongside of making decisions that are specific to characters. Uh, having the knowledge of how to create them, how to engineer the clothing so that it actually works the way that you want for it to work within a scene, definitely. And going on that, um, and continuing this theme of, of, of fittings, I, Bob and Jacqueline, I actually want to ask you, you know, uh, you also have a very action, you had a very action heavy movie with Dune. As you were working with your actors, you know, what, what do you consider like good etiquette for an actor during a costume fitting? Bob, you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, I, I always think about the still suit when I think about fittings. Um, it, and, I, and I'll speak about etiquette, but mm -hmm. letting the actor find that character and, and helping them into that. Like Janty said, we are, um, the, one of the first people to see them. And, and you do provide that ability to find a hook. Um, that, that still suit that we did had to fit a, a range of people. Each one was a bespoke suit. Each one was custom made. <clears throat> and they had to fit everyone from Timothy to, to Rebecca to Jason Momoa. So, you know, finding that individuality in that costume that they all wore uh, was was a challenge and a joy. I think um, Jacqueline told me, I, I think Timothy was the first one to put it on. Yes. 
Yeah. Right. And he he just became that character in that suit. You you watched yeah. him look at himself in the mirror, and then suddenly he was down on the floor and doing the sand walk and crawling across the floor and and finding this this Paul Atreides character out in the desert. Um, uh, but I'll let Jacqueline talk about that. Well, I always feel I agree with Janie Jan to you that um, the costume first costume fitting is the bridge from the actor to the character, and it's so it's so important. And the most rewarding thing is watching a consummate actor; uh, their whole body language changes when you've got the right thing on them. Uh, and it's um, you know I, I'll never forget a fitting I had with Jeffrey Rush and the Mark playing the Marquis de Sade, where he's so languid and he's, it's like he has no bones naturally, Jeffrey. He's so fluid, his moments. And when he put on the Marquis de Sade's uh, ancien suit, he just, his whole body language changed. And I think if you treat it like actors like onion skins, where you're just peeling off the layers, you finally get to the character when you get to the right, right when you get the right skin on them. So it's so that's the most rewarding thing for me uh, is watching them change and find that person. You have to kind of dress them from the inside out. I, I was a fashion designer and I, my first movie was Quills. And my husband said, I said, I can't do period. I'm a thoroughly modern Millie. <laughs> and he said, yes, you can. He said, you just take them shopping and the fi figure out who they are. He's a writer. He said, figure out who they are on the inside and then take them shopping in their period and only put on them what they would pick. Once you find who they are, then they can, they'll let you know. They will inform you what to wear. It doesn't matter what period you're, you're doing. So I've always kind of relied on that. And, and another thing Ana East Nin said was the smallest little detail uh, of a costume can reveal the inner riches of a character. And if you can point that out to an actor, they will grab onto that. And it really does uh, provide, help them get across that bridge from actor to character. And they'll rely on it. Sometimes they, those little things become talismans for the actors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting that we've all, you commented um, that we've all turned up in black and um, I feel like there's thinking about fittings, um, which is sort of such a place of trust. And it's kind of a dance of trust, really, in a way, um, particularly when you meet an actor for the first time and you've never worked with him before. And um, I love that space. There's a kind of tension about it. And, and I think I'm not sure if we probably would all agree that we you sort of turn up with... Um, the concepts and all the work you've done, and perhaps particularly in New Zealand, I often only see actors for a very short time because they've flown all the way here not long before we shoot. And, you know, it's it's quite an intense kind of pressured time. And for me, like, I'm very conscious of not turning up with a big personal pre presence. It's often kind of like quite a minimal sort of channeling type vibe in a sense because there's a lot that happens in the space between you and you're often you're offering like um say for instance with benedict um you know his whole i had to fly down from auckland with it all to meet him in the south island and you know i'm bringing everything that he that we will work with um and so it's yeah it's quite a um it's quite a sort of sacred space um, that I think we create with with actors, yeah, which I really enjoy a lot. And sometimes we have to be actors. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you mean that you know, the, the I mean, we've I'm sure we've all experienced the actors who come in all excited and ready to embrace or collaborate and be a part of the process and the ones you have to drag in, you know, and beg for the five minutes to show or touch. And I, I, I was listening to all of you and, and the mixed feelings of the joy of when you, you're working with someone who is 
it's like a kid in a candy store and it's, they get to, to touch and talk and the characters come into them as they're starting to put the pieces on. I mean, you mentioned Zazie's hat. I mean, she was my longest fitting. I think it was like four or five hours because it was a transformation for her and even the hat making it taller because it made her more powerful and it empowered her. But then I've had other actors where <laughs> you have to kind of ease them into it and, you know, come on, try those cowboy boots. Let's, let's try a few silhouettes, you know, and just kind of warm them up to the process till they start to realize, oh, this is for me. This is not a chore. This is not something that I have, you know, it, I, I, I don't know for the rest of you, but it's just, it, it pulls at my heart when I have to literally beg you to put something on that is going to help you to find your character or to do the best job. I'm there to help you do the best you can do and, and not sometimes giving us the time that we need to do our jobs to aid you in that it is, it's, it's, it's disheartening at times, mm-hmm. you know? So you can, ha- you can be joyful in one second and really sad and frustrated in the other. It's like, Jesus Christ, I'm here to help you. <laughs> Put the damn clothes on. <laughs> um, I, I feel like there's a lot of stories to be told in that, but uh, that, Anton, I'm glad you brought that up because that goes back to my question about etiquette. So if all of you could offer one piece of advice, especially not just for leads, but you know, for, for actors maybe with a smaller role or a background role, if they're getting, if they're doing a fit, fitting, what's, what is, you know, what's good etiquette? What's a piece of advice that you can give them to make it go smoothly? Flesh colored underwear for women. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. I'm taking notes on this. I like this is this is gold. <laughs> and uh, underpants for men. Uh, underwear <laughs> that always helps. Yeah, wear them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Any color, wear them. <laughs> uh, it's a it, that's a hard ask because. I mean, I I haven't had that much sort of kind of rejection when they come into the fitting room. They're usually terribly excited and you're there and you're molding this character and they're so enthusiastic and so pro and so for it. And just, it's a wonderful experience. I, I couldn't, I wouldn't like to advise them on etiquette except for just be really enthusiastic and have your heart in your hands and they nearly always are which is glorious i think they also are very confident when they know you've done your homework that you've put as much time into who they are who that character is either historically or modern day with with some kind of backup story that they can you know uh, start trusting you. Mm. So much of it yeah. is trust, you know, and and I think it's also important to be honest. I, I am a big one to tell actors when I see that something isn't working on them, mm. I say it. I never try to sell anything just because it was an original choice of mine. You, you kind of, you get a feeling, and I also think that gives them confidence that you're not going to put something on them that you don't really believe in. Well, a happy, happily dressed actor is a happy actor. She gives exactly. a happy performance. Absolutely. And your director will be happy then as well. Mm. Yeah, you don't want to send an unhappy actor to your director, <laughs> especially when you love your director. <laughs> exactly. I, I think for me, um, I, I completely agree with everybody. I think um, what Antoinette just mentioned kind of like sparked something. You know, I think sometimes it, it would be great for folks to know that when they go into a costume fitting that, um, you know, that uh, uh, maybe just an idea of like a little bit of grace, I I suppose that there are so many people who worked on this um, to sort of create an environment where, you know, you, the actor can walk into this room to create with us, you know? Um, And I think that's always um, uh, zooming out, you know, is always kind of, 
that we're all here to work, you know, um, is, 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 is whenever there's an actor who I know, like, is able to see that, able to see sort of the labor that had gone through um, to, to create this environment for them, I think it's always appreciated, you know. Um, Thank you, Clint. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say, you know, uh, for the actor to stay flexible um, and and uh, enter into the journey, uh, you know, and kind of uh, be invested in in finding it uh, with along with me. I usually take that as a given. <laughs> It's also, also funny because I think any information, whether or not they reject something, right? Whether or not they, there's, there's, or whether, how, however violent the reaction is, it's always information. You know what I mean? And, and I think sometimes uh, I personally, like, I, I, uh, I have to remind myself, oh, right, this is just more information about him as an actor, uh, you know, him as a blah, blah, blah. And, and it's always, it, 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 it's, it's a fact find, it's a, it's, it's a detective story. That's all. You're really just finding clues, right? Like clues on who the character is, clues on how you're going to work with this human being, clues on you know how this will go. You know what I mean? And I and 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 I think um, that to me is exciting. That's a, such a privilege, you know, to to have a job that's actually about that. You know. Well, I want to close out on uh, a, a little fun rapid fire question. This was all, so fantastic. Great advice, everybody. Um, we'll definitely wear, you know, nude colored underwear. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, but I want you all to complete this sentence. When I signed up to be a costume designer, I didn't know there would be so much blank. Fun. Fun. I like that. Catherine Paul, what did you say? Sorry. Uh, no, I was. I mean, I, 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 I didn't say, but uh, I, I would say, um, I, you know, uh, psychology. Mm. Mm. Antoinette, when you signed up to be a costume designer, you didn't know there would be so much blank. It would be so much knowledge. I, I learn, I learn something with every job. You know, it's like going back to school every single time. Yeah, yeah, true. I have to second that emotion. And it's also, you get to time travel. You get to live in periods that you never experienced, would have experienced, and, and in places you never would have gone to. Yeah, I never realized that. And I think I didn't realize that um, a lot of my work would be about... Um, Team, you know, I mean, I, how you um, relate to people and how you empower people. And um, of course, I never thought it was a singular job at all because it's so the op, you know, that's what I love about it is the collaborative nature. But um, there's, there's a lot of my work is about um, that, yeah, making, lifting people up and, um, and, bring people along with you and and I really love that aspect and find it challenging at times as well. Bob Clint Antoinette. I I I didn't realize how much joy uh, I would get and and what incredible experiences um, I would experience um, beyond my wildest dreams really. For me I think I didn't realize that I would be able to actually work my own shit out. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like <laughs> it's such a privilege to literally have to encounter characters and people that, that help you actually have more compassion um, uh, on yourself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, more. Um, you just learn so much about yourself, you know, by meeting these imaginary people and real people, too. So, I, I, you know, that's a, uh, that's a gift. Well, this was so informative. Um, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your stories. I wish we had more time. I feel like we could, I don't know, talk for, for two hours at least about this, but, you know, also for sharing your craft with um, the sag After Foundation and sag After artists. So thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> see you, everyone. Nice Bye. to see everyone. Everybody. Nice to be with all of you.